I have a hard time disamb- uh, disambiguating yeah. that word again. Uh, what's just the physical illness and then what's um, an effect of or associated with other phenomena. Yeah. Uh, and so like Doug and I were just talking earlier, world phenomena, the news, the zeitgeist, mm-hmm. spiritual, our souls, etc. And so, and that's part of why I wanted to have this talk actually is because I would like to disambiguate some of those terms. Uh, I was also relating to to Doug earlier that I've been experiencing a kind of swirling with Mm -hmm. a swirling sense with the concepts that we've been throwing around and the many different references and authors, et cetera. Uh, Some sense that it's structure is breaking apart or there's a a, uh, decomposition happening and so I, I, I would like to, and as I proposed in the forum to- topic, have a kind of groundwork mm-hmm. uh, conversation that looks at the language that we're using and uh, where it comes from, uh, what it means uh, to, to us respectively and together, and to create some I'm going to, I can't help but presuppose some of this language, uh, spaciousness or some, uh, some time freedom uh, around what we're talking about. And so uh, it, it's become a kind of um, almost like a, I wouldn't call it a full-blown blown crisis, but certainly mm-hmm. it's having uh, effects on my health. And so I... I would like to, well, I, 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 I suppose gain some clarity, but I also had this moment earlier watching the video that John shared of Jude. Um, Curvan. Cur- Curvan. 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 Yeah. I, my mind came to a certain limit. As, <laughs> that's why I just gave you the... The symbol of the pyramid here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And she was talking about time and space as information, and mm-hmm. and uh, the uh, aspect of entropy, and how entropy is connected to evolution, and how evolution is an increase in information. And um, then she got into some fairly, you know. Uh, to me, advanced topics in in physics like the Planck length and mm-hmm. um, uh, the notion of a f- of well the, the topological uh, idea yeah. of the universe as a as a as a flat surface rather than as a three dimensional surface and my I basically just threw up my arms and said, I don't understand this I don't know what <laughs> is going on and I, I need help. Help. So, so, John, you graciously offered to uh, help frame the, the conversation with. Uh, um, I would. I would love Brown. to. Mm-hmm. I would love to, with your permission and with the group's permission, just ask three questions. This is a, what I, I call a clean start. Uh, I thought the seed questions. I don't think we had any seed questions, but your um, your preface was great, and. Um, talking about the personal, the cosmological, the psychological. I just want to ask three questions of each of you. And then at the end of our session today, I would like to uh, do a little follow-up. And what's in between is where we can go all over the place. Um, But I think it really helps to have a clean start. Marco, can we start with you? Sure. Okay. For this session to be really useful for you, this session will be like what? It will be like floating on a raft down a a peaceful um, peaceful stream or creek. Floating on a raft Mm -hmm. down a peaceful stream or creek. Mm -hmm.
and for this session to be like floating on a raft on a peaceful stream or creek, you will be like what? I, I will be um, like, a, like an observer enjoying mm -hmm. the ride. Like an observer enjoying the ride. Mm -hmm. And what support do you need from the group so that you can be like an observer enjoying the ride? Or what resources would you like to develop? I would ask that the group help me make sure we don't crash into <laughs> a big rock. <laughs> okay. Help, help you help us not to crash into a big rock. Or go off a waterfall or smash into any other <laughs> disastrous object. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else? That any, uh, help you need? Okay. Great. Thank you. Is it Doug? Can I ask you the same questions? Yes, I've already oh. forgotten them. Well, well, forgotten me, them, so that helps. Let me repeat it. Um, for this session to be really useful for you, this session will be like what? So, I gave the metaphor just a little bit ago about my desire to be a grandfather watching my family and friends uh, play out everything. Um, so in a sense, I, similar to Marco, I want to take a step back and learn from what I observe in this session. Okay. You would like this session to be like a desire to be a grandfather and family and friends. Can you, Clarify that for me. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. So it's a relaxed, laid back position in which I'm the observer observing the activity in front of me. Okay, a relaxed, laid back observer. And what support do you need from the group? From the group would be to I, or, I guess provide, provide, provide a a nice dance or a nice just play. I, I'd, I'd like to see good activity going on. Play and good activity going on. Thank you, Mr. Ed. No, no, the talking horse. He's back. <laughs> uh, for this session to be really useful for you, this session will be like what? It's going to be like a merry-go-round. Ah, a merry-go-round. A merry-go-round. And for this session to be like a merry-go-round, you will be like what? Like one of those horses that goes up and down when it goes around. <laughs> one of those horses that goes yep. up and down. Yep. And what uh, support or help do you need from the group or resources that you would like to develop? Um, what I need is for everyone else to make sure that the music that's playing in the background doesn't get too loud. Ah, background music, not yes. too loud. That's, that, what is that instrument that the thing, you know? <laughs> so not too loud. Not too loud, yeah. Okay, great. I think it's a Wurlitzer organ. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's got that. It's got a very unique tonal quality to it. I've always found. Maybe it's the cheap speakers on the carousel. I, I'm being kind of spontaneous here with my um, because I haven't for this session to be really useful. This session will be like a lucid dream, mm. a lucid waking dream, and for this session to be useful for be like a waking lucid dream, I will be like a lucid waking dreamer, I guess. I'll be able to move comfortably between different uh, styles of, of thinking and feeling. The support I need is um, 
your open curiosity and your your uh, generosity and your kindness, which you've demonstrated many times before. So with that, I'll turn the floor over to you guys. And um, we could go into a, an open frame or um, a free for all or um, an all over the place. If you had any serendipitous learnings or synchronistic learnings, I'd be very curious about that. Or if you um, want to review any of the um, the people that we've discussed online, I think we've lots of different people have come up. Hmm. I, I'd like I to just like make to a quick comment that I, I think I'm in the same same space as Marcos in the sense that there's been a lot of swirling around, especially since joining this community. There's I, I, I want to. I have 90 books that I've got laying around that I never knew would uh, come my way, and I can't even read one of them right now. <laughs> I'm unable to uh, read a few sentences before I become distracted, so I'm, I'm hoping to become more grounded, and that's the purpose of this talk, so uh, I, to, I just wanted to... Become, to, to become more grounded. Yes, or I, return yes. to my core. How will you know when you're more grounded? You said something about your course. I'll start by being able to read a two or three pages <laughs> at a time. <laughs> but uh, Okay. Yeah. Very good. I have, I have one comment I'd like to throw in right at the very beginning here. I wanted to thank Marco very much for proposing this particular session because this is something that's been mulling around in the back of my mind, and he brought it right up to the front where it needed to be. And um, I think, I, I personally think it was a, it's a tremendously courageous act to ask something as fundamental as what, what is being asked, because I, I really think this is something that, that we all struggle with in one way or another. I know that I do. So this, this was very, it was very helpful to me to see that, okay, well, I'm not alone in that, that struggling with it. Because some days I think I, I have a pretty good handle on, on things like space and time. And the next day, I haven't the slightest idea what's going on. <laughs> and then, you know, the next day, some things come a little clear, you know, or, the, or you, or I have to thank you, John, for the, uh, the, the Curry Van, uh, uh, clips. Uh, she starts out great and you're going, Oh yes, yes, yes. And then all of a sudden she shoots off into, I don't know, Planckian scales and I'm going, okay, well that's real nice. <laughs> the Planck now, scale. Yeah. And the pixelation. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and so she's using a lot of, a lot of very apt uh, metaphors, I find. Um, um, the only thing disconcerting about about either uh, the clips that I saw, and I, I saw the Mishlov one and also the, the other one that she was, um, what, the only thing that bothered me is the, the, the woman who asked the first questions after the talk also asked about free will, and she got cut off, and everybody else got to ask more than one question. And, and I'm going, but that's the one I wanted to hear the answer to. <laughs> well, that would have been my book. question. That was my, I had written that down on my paper, and this woman asked the question. We're synchronicity. But, <laughs> and she got cut off and didn't get to answer it. So I have to, I'm going to have to mull over that one too, in addition to everything else this week. <laughs> but that, that was just prefacing what we're doing. Uh, I want to ask maybe Marco or all of you what I got. Marco mentioned um, we have to become acquainted with the meta mind. And I'm wondering what, can you define that in your terms, Marco or whoever else has their own idea? But that, that seems to be the starting point you wanted for this conversation in a sense. Mm. And, yeah. and meta mind and super mind, did you say there was something you needed to do one before the other? I, I thought meta mime should come before super mind, um, and th and the reason is because of scale. 
I, I see MetaMind as group scale and SuperMind as cosmic scale. And we're, you know, we, I think, kind of leap or you know, into or have experienced cosmic scale uh, and, or, and or void scale, those being, I think, mutually interrelated. Uh, but I think part of what makes it difficult, perhaps, to stabilize or to um, if not stabilize experience, stabilize access to cosmic or supermind is that we are oscillating more between personal or egoic mind and, and you've brought in the distinction between self and ego mm. and, 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 and group. And there's some uh, intelligence that arises from a meta mind that you can't locate as coming from yourself, nor from any other individual, but really from the interactions between them. And yet the insight or experience or idea or image, whatever it is, has a concreteness to it. It does occur to you. And so you do experience it in a personal, on a, on a personal level. So I, I thought that, because part of my experience involves a sort of swirling around self or a swirling around personal concerns, anxieties, etc., And that those are taking the shape or are being, are presenting as uh, these conceptual sort of battles between space, time, entropy, uh, order, and uh, various other kind of factions of you know, ontological factions, but then ontology is sort of factionalized against epistemology. And uh, uh, there, there must be some, uh, it, it seems to me, some, some leap possible to a, to a coherence uh, amongst them. And I think that that could occur through this analysis of, uh, and more than analysis, that, that's putting it in, mental terms, but an intuition, a, gra a wearing mm -hmm. to, uh, of the, the, the distinctions and nuances that distinguish these various uh, conceptual schema. And so uh, I, I, I'd like to actually begin with, with a specific question or specific kind of query and it has to do with space specifically. And in particular with the conception of space that we find in physics, including that which is described by Jude uh, Curavan. And I think the conception of space that Slaughter, Peter Sloterdijk has, which strikes me as a fundamentally different kind of space that he's talking about. And I don't, I don't feel like we've articulated that well in relation or the relation between that and the, the physical. So I'm, I'm, I'd be curious to, to, yeah, to, to, to hear what you think about that. I'd, I'd like to respond. Love. Where is love? Love is a concept, it's an idea. Now, if you would ask me that, I would like, well, I feel like something here, like around my heart, and it's warm, and it's kind of fuzzy, and it's soft, and it feels real good. This is the location, these are some of the qualities and that's like what? It's like a red, red rose. See this? Pretty flower, red, stem with thorns on it. This is concrete. I can point to this, this actual physical rose, or I could refer to, a, to the word rose 
and all of you would have associations for that because we're all speakers of English. But these are these are different spaces: the conceptual, the perceptual, and our development goes from concrete to abstract. And I believe it goes back, back and forth. We oscillate from concrete to abstract. And I find words like epistemology and ontology mean nothing to me. They are empty concepts. I can look them up in a dictionary, theory of knowledge, theory of reality, whatever. <laughs> it doesn't mean much to me. So that's why as a perceptual learner, I have to constantly be tuning in to my perceptual space. And then I can find a way of making sense of philosophy, psychology, epistemology, all of these big, big words. Because I, I and my body knows a whole lot more about all this than I do. I'm pretty convinced of that. I mean, I can do tasks like feed it and exercise it and you know, give it interesting things to do. <clears throat> but basically, it's metabolizing all kinds of information on many different levels. And, um, you know, I can't keep, possibly keep track of the various intelligences, these consortium of intelligences that are working through me and with me and the particular environments that I find myself in. So that's... So when we're talking about cosmology, I think it's very, very tricky because we have these instruments which mimic our senses. We have telescopes, we have microscopes, and we can go to levels which are beyond us physically, but that we can get information about and we can get numbers about, we can get quantities and we create maps. So we get maps of the very large and maps of the very small. And we, co we attempt to coordinate all these maps and we inevitably use metaphors. And I think one of the ones that she used that I really liked, she said, it's not a big bang. In the beginning, there was a big breath. And she said it was, it was an out breath. It was exquisite, ordered and fine tuned. This is a very feminine <laughs> you know, only a man would come up with bing bang, you know. Mm -hmm. She's coming up with a different metaphor. And she's talking about each of us as a finite thought form within a unified universe, within a cosmos. So she makes these distinctions between a cosmos, which is infinite, and our particular universe, which is finite and closed. Um, and she thinks we are at the edge of a cliff, that we're, uh, our science is very fragmented, and the dysfunctional behaviors that we are demonstrating on a large scale are uh, creating the conditions, you know, for our potential breakthrough or breakdown. Because there are attract, there's, she uses the, uh, the attractor, um, of a, of a more coherent attractor that the system could move towards, take that leap towards that. Um, but there's no guarantee. So if the system is, if there's enough stability in the system when it's deeply perturbed as our system is now, it's possible that if, with enough st stability, we can move to a more coherent attractor. But if there isn't enough stability, what usually happens is it breaks down and goes to a, a previous, a regressive stage. So I think we're, it's very important for me personally that I'm moving towards more coherence, accepting the complexity, because she says the direction of time is towards that. And she talks about entropy as being something that we're all familiar with. If you, she says, if you have any children, you know what this is. In the morning, they're bright and happy and wanting to go out and do stuff. At the end of the day, they're grumpy and grouchy and they're tired. <clears throat> so that's the direction of time. It goes from order to disorder. So I think there has to be some balance between all of these different kinds of conceptual spaces 
and psychological spaces and behavioral spaces and cultural spaces. And so I'm doing the best I can to use language in a, in a way that reconnects psyche and soma. So whereabouts is that? Does it have a size or a shape? What kind of is that? Is there anything else about that? These are questions that generate qualities. And then we can start having, I think, uh, finer and more discriminating con concepts will emerge out of a rigorous phenomenological investigation. And this, can't, this can happen individually and collectively as we've been experimenting here. Because the last time we modeled maps of time, each of us worked individually, but everyone else was aware of this. So, and at the beginning of this call, I asked each of you for this call to be useful, it would be like what for each of you? But everyone else now knows, oh, this is what would be useful for Ed. This is what's useful for Doug. This is what's useful for, you know, all of us. So we know what each of us needs, what kind of support we need. So then we can start to reorganize our system, hopefully in a way that's more sensitive and nuanced than if we were just operating out of this solipsistic kind of um, me first kind of um, mindset, which we've all been raised to um, cultivate that. <clears throat> so anyway, my hope is that we can use our gathering here and our, our information sharing and our developing ideas and affects and, and cognitions that are going to move us towards coherence rather than breakdown. And it's really up to us, not just us here, but and all the groups that you participate with beyond our group. Uh, I'm hoping that there'll be something here that you could get a chance to rehearse or play with. This is my metaphor, the theater metaphor, for some performance out there in those other groups that could be very useful for you and for those groups. So this is my hope uh, and my expectation also, because I find what's underneath the mind my experience with working with people and um, working with dreams, all of the uh, paranormal experiences I have had and the, the ones that I've, other people have shared with me, we are immense, <laughs> we are amazing. And we just have to find a way of grounding this. And I think we have uh, tremendous opportunities. But you know, there's no guarantee. So my feeling is um, let's use all of our knowledge, body knowledge, cognitive knowledge, knowledge of history, knowledge of our imagination. Let's use all of it and use all of it well. Because I think cultivating our imaginations in a healthy way is very, very important. That, that's it's all why... to go off the deep end because we're surrounded by negative mentations and the products of that. So I think it's either love or fear, as they say in The Course in Miracles. I know that sounds corny, but it's, it's kind of true. <laughs> and I think that's also what she was saying in her, her conversation. Anyway. That's, that's why I proposed the idea of a, a John bot a few days back. Uh, just I love that. Then I can take a that, nap. <laughs> that idea to kind of, kind of what you're talking about is the, the grounding of this conversation is even up with four minds that are quite similar. We can at least agree on that. Um, and we're aiming at the same goal. We have we'll start a starting point. Imagine that within any conversation you have and without throughout the day, that's almost an impossibility. Um, with the grocery store clerk or whatever it might be, um, you just happen to get even four of your best friends together. You're not going to have this the space here. So a John bot for that, uh, like where, where can we have that come into play? But um, you mentioned for this kind of the site, like for anybody that's watching or anybody that uh, goes to the site, like that that's a good starting point. And it's a great starting point for this conversation. I believe. <laughs> so <thank> you, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'd like to experience the John bot. <laughs> 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 uh, 
and I don't know how long it's going to take, how many people to program that one, I can tell you. <laughs> With my own skeptical view of uh, AI, that, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> this is why we have John. Yeah, that really scares me. Yeah, and no, well, we do, John. And, I, you know, that's, that's the part where, you know, as, as much as people might like to or a lot of, of folks think that we're, you know, making headway in that direction. See, I, the qualities that you bring to the conversation are not things that are programmable. They're not algorithmic. Or I, I, so I don't, I don't know how you get that in, into some kind of language that is basically at, at, at root algorithmic. So um, I, I'm not concerned that you would, you would be replaced anytime soon. You're probably irreplaceable, period. It, and I'm talking about now in the cosmic scheme of things because, you know, you are who you are, where you are, when you are as we all are. And um, although I don't ascribe, I don't ascribe the uniqueness to that uniqueness that most people would ascribe to uniqueness. You know, we're all unique, just like everyone else. And what we don't appreciate is our uniqueness. And what we don't appreciate, also don't appreciate is how much we're like everyone else. That That's one of the things that always kind of tears, you know, I, I have, I have, Herman Hesse would say, I have two hearts beating in my breast. Um, and what, you know, it's, whether it's light or dark or however you want to, want to formulate that, but, but we do have these inherent paradoxes, these contradictions within ourselves that we need to, to come to terms with. And the expressions that we, that we find for ourselves, just like, like you, you do, and you bring uh, to our conversation, you, you bring in a lot of uh, metaphors I would never think of. You know, I've always, I've always liked theater, but I've never thought of myself as a theater kind of person. I've had, you know, my, my niece is really big into theater. And you know, so she, she wants to go do that. And I, I don't really understand that all that much, but I understand that that's what she wants to do. And that, that, that part I'm excited about because she wants to do it. I, I'm always pleased when I see people who do things because... They want to do them for whatever reason they want to do them. I, I think that's a good thing to do because too often I would like to do things, but I can't for whatever reasons. And I realize there's a certain amount of uh, qualification that goes on to bring that down. But I'm, I've always been a person that's been looking for um, simplicity. That's why talk of entropy and talk of um, has always appealed to me because well, it's kind of like Doug says, I can tell you, once you become a grandfather, you never sit back and just look at what other people are doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that ain't going to happen either. You know, we're going to get a John bot and we're not going to get the, <laughs> we're not gonna get the, the grandfather that observes. <laughs> okay. And, and when I think about, about my own uh, grandfather, my, I only actually had one for any length of time was my great grandfather. Uh, he was anything but an observer. <laughs> he, he was always in the midst of things. He was always in the thick of things and he always had something to say, but what he had to say was worth listening to, even though most people didn't want to listen to it because they thought they had heard it a thousand times. But I, I realized that when he said it like the 10th or 20th time, I started getting an idea of what it is he was talking about. And then I realized there's, there's a real value in, we, Gabe's what we call it, that mythological, that return of things. It keeps coming back. It keeps coming. And, and the coming back is all, always a reminder. It's something that, to, to show you what you might have missed the first time around, so to speak. Because for me, being as simplistic as I, I, I am, um, I remember, I think it was Einstein that said that, Time is what prevents everything from happening at once. And, and I thought, well, that's the most brilliant description I've ever heard. And to this day, I, I still have a really warm place in my heart for that description. Because that, that's what time does for us. And, and leading up to this conversation this evening, since Marco had asked me, well, what do, we, what do we think about time and space and how do we know it? I'm... I'm off here thinking, and, and for me, space is what prevents all of us from colliding all of the time. It, it, it gives us a little bit of room from one another. 
It's, it's, it's analogous to time in that, in that regard. And I think that's very important because I don't see space. And I, I know this is a problem I have with, with Slaughter Night. I don't see space as anything special other than it provides me room to deal with whomever or whatever I encounter. So it's not, to me, it's not important about, let's say, the, the space of intimacy. What's important to me is the place of intimacy. This also came up in our, our, our um, discussions in, in, in uh, book one, mm-hmm. the one I read. And to me, place is more important than space because space is where the quality of space comes out. This is where I am and I'm not bumping into someone else or, or overstepping them or overlaying them or overcrowding them or, or I'm allowing them to be, I, I say next to me, but in, a, in the positive sense. Uh, one of the things that's always bothered me about the English language and, um, and, and some ancient notions, um, we say, we say in, in, in uh, the, the great commandment in, in the Bible in English is, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself. But in German, you can't say that. You don't say your neighbor. You say and love the next one as yourself. And it's, and it's the same idea that Stephen Stills had in his song, you have to love, you have to love the one you're with, who's, who's ever there. It doesn't matter who it is. That's the one who is next to you. The, the, Even if you don't like them? <laughs> huh? Right. It, Even if you don't like them? It doesn't. Yeah, that's the, that's the, 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 the kicker is it doesn't matter whether you do. They're the, they're the ones. They're the ones you have to deal with. That's, that's the place that you're in, the space that you're in, perhaps, if you want to phrase that the way. And that's the one that you deal with because that's who's there. So you always deal with what's there, when you are, where you are, kind of thing. You see, and that's and that that for me is what, and out of that come these qualities that you so vibrantly describe so often, John. You know, because I don't ask myself those questions. Well, well what shape or form might this have? <laughs> because to me, at that case, it has zero shape, zero form. It simply has a level of intensity that I need to engage and interact with or deal with. Most of the time it's dealing with when you're a curmudge and you do a lot of dealing with. <laughs> okay. And, and, that, and, and for me, that's how, that's how we kind of arrange or interact with one another. Or, or I don't even know the words that I'm looking for right now. Uh, you, you said the level of intensity. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think that's a... And systems theory, what tips a system is often has to do with intensity. Mm-hmm. So if there's, um, you have a problem over here and you want to get to this outcome over there, this outcome has to be more intense than this problem. Mm-hmm. Tip it in that direction. So, and we've all had that experience of like wanting to change something and it wouldn't change, but something happened and you reached a threshold and it popped and you went in a different direction and you knew at that moment that you could never go back to the way mm-hmm. it was before because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. the system has tipped. And I think this is, um, and since we're all members of multiple systems at different rates of flow and exchange, it's, it takes a great deal of uh, care and concern uh, and being able to, mo- like you said, the level of intensity, is this appropriate? Mm-hmm. Or am I, um, premature, uh, if we reach a threshold and we go to a more complex, more coherent, um, or are we going to break down? Mm -hmm. Um, So my thing is, I think this, I have to monitor myself very carefully, or, and I have to ask these questions or I would have gone mad Mm -hmm. out of my mind a long time ago. I don't know. It's just, I had too many stressors. And I had too much trauma too early. And I'm having to deal 
as I get older with more and more stress, mm -hmm. having to, what's the level of intensity here? And it's an ongoing, it's like a laboratory for me. My metaphor for myself mm -hmm. is like, I'm a laboratory. Mm -hmm. All kinds of experiments are being conducted, not just by my ego or myself, but by other selves and other egos. Um, and I just wanted to share something that's, I believe, the serendipitous learning that came out of the inquiry of our last session and um, the things that we shared online. I did have, and I, and I hope this is relevant to our, you know, some of our desired outcomes. I had a moment of um, real serendipity, I think. And I think I recorded, um, I, I recorded a, a dream that I had and I was working with some of the, the themes and the motifs that had emerged in our conversations. And I just wanted to excerpt a little bit from that and follow up with what happened the following night, because I believe this is a serendipitous learning. Could be synchronistic, I'm not sure. But I, um, just briefly, I, I, in this dream space, and I'm in a lucid dream at this point. I see the presence of a male entity. He's very benevolent, and we commune together. It's in a void except for this presence. And I only can discern, I get a male energy and that he's humanoid. Beyond that, I don't know anything. I ask, what is our relationship to the earth? And he says, we are para to the earth. And then I wake up think about what that could mean, and then I go back into the dream time. And then I see all these uh, entities who are in between matter and mind, and they're sharing healing energies. And I'm watching people exchange energy, or entities. They're sort of humanoid. Some of them are visible, half visible, invisible. I, have to I think the more invisible they are, the, uh, the less engaged in matter they are and the more humanoid i th i always tend to assume oh they're more they're more of a in matter but you know these are my categories that i'm imposing on phenomena that you know i have not a very good map for because <clears throat> none of this is particularly stable so i'm then i'm in this cafe area with a man and i saw him doing some healing work with some of these other entities. And it looks like a cafe, it feels like a cafe. He says that he has a very strong energy and I trust him. And I say to him, I live in chaos. And he tells me about his father. He says that he loved his father. And I said, well, I hated my father. My father spit on me and told me that he wished I had never been born than to be a queer. And I contact this vast hatred for the evil father. And then the man says to me, he doesn't say anything. He tell, I could feel this telepathically. He let me know that I had contaminated his love space for his father with my energetic malpractice because I had unintended, I had contaminated his space. As I contacted that hatred, I had actually contaminated this space and I had to apologize. I felt a need to apologize. And the next night I started to do the tetralemma. Does anyone know Nagarjuna and the tetralemma? Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful process. It comes out of uh, uh, the, the middle way logic. So I just worked with it while I was in this dream state. Hate, love. I am hate, I am love. Over here, I am both love and hate. And back there, I am neither love nor hate. And in between love, hate, both love, hate, neither love nor hate, I am this ineffable center. So I was able to find contact center, very peaceful. And then, I, then I'm in a room with a lot of entities and there's the same, or the man that I felt like was connected to the previous experience. And I touched him on the shoulder and there was a current of well-being that flowed. And I looked and I saw a symbol. And when I woke up, I drew it. And this is the symbol. 
Can you see this? You have to move back a little bit. Too. Okay. Oh, good. Can you see that? Yeah, no, yeah. I can. Yeah, so it's a it's sort of like a bell shape. Mm -hmm. There's a circle. It's penetrated by a line, mm -hmm. but it's not completely penetrated. Mm -hmm. Only half of it is penetrated. So I feel like there's something open, but within the circle, there's a partition halfway so that there's still capacity to move back and forth around that partition. partition. This is my, both sides of my brain are trying to get unified. I don't know what this means. All I know is this is as accurate a report as I can make. So I'm just saying we have all kinds of, there are many, there, it's, we have all these signs. It's, it, to me, the self is a semiological communication device. And I don't think language is necessarily about communication all the time. I think a lot of language is about modeling. It's a tool for modeling. But I'm trying to break, I'm trying to create a bridge between these different worlds, just for my own aesthetic pleasure, but also perhaps if there's a, a usefulness for others, I'll share it mm -hmm. and hopefully catalyze some sort of process. Because I think we need to like, like she was saying, we got to put this all out on the table. And there's a lot of haunted, traumatic episodes that have happened on this planet. And a lot of hungry ghosts are in circulation. A lot of fear-based fear initiatives. And I think they're just, if there's just enough of us who can register the love, register the hate, register love and hate, and register neither love nor hate, we have and can stay in that ineffable center, I think we have a very good chance of getting to something more coherent than we have now. But I may be wrong, you know, but I think it's definitely worth the effort. Yeah. Even, if I've, even if I lose a few hours sleep, because I have to get up in the middle of the night to do all this. <laughs> and I also, I have to rehearse a few things. I'm, I'm working with a Vajrayana, I'm working with a Tetralemma, I'm working with a lot of healing practices. And I find the ones that are, that are useful for me and I experiment with them, see if they have any effect. So, wish me luck. May, may I ask, John, well, I may I ask, is the, uh, the way the, is the Tetralemma in time and space? How's the Tetralemma in time and space? Um, I, I think it's, I think it's both because it takes time to do it. You have to find, actually they use the north, south, east, west. I use my right, my left, front, and the back because I was lying down in bed and my body was asleep. So I, but I contacted in the sleep, the, the dream body, the dreaming body, if you want to call it that, or the subtle body still has a, a sense of a front, the back and the left and the right. Mm -hmm. And I, um, and I just played with this. I went over there, registered, got into the hate, went over here, got into the love, went over here, did both, let it blend, and then go here and go into the, uh, that double negative, neither this nor that. Mm. And then I let it happen. Whatever wanted to arise, just arise. But it is, it's space and it is time. Because something does blend, but you have to differentiate it in a space. And you have to register certain states. So I think it's an internal state, internal process. But, so, you know, this is dream time. This isn't like physical time. If you clocked me, I don't think that what happened on the clock matters that much. Because I could be in this space for, you know, a few minutes, but it might feel subjective, like, like hours. I've had that experience many times. I'll have a incredible experience out of body or whatever some dream state or contacting some multi-dimensional being and i'll think it i was there for for weeks and i come back and it was just a few minutes of clock time so it's there's a i think dream time and it's a very different kind of time and i think this is some of the stuff we've been studying with the absurd i hope that 
is a useful response. Mm -hmm. I've had to think about it. Yeah, I personally I feel that um, I, I've had experience with yoga nidra. I haven't gone to any workshops or anything, but I, I had a lot of I do that time um, to reflect on it. And it's the same idea of seeing the boundaries almost as um, Siddhartha no, Herman Hesse, I guess that's how you pronounce his name, but a lot of that is seeing like just the, the love hate symbols, the left right, the whatever else um, you have. But it, once you you're talking about combining it uh, or saying what is love and hate, and then it it kind of brings you into a space where it's almost timeless, spaceless, um, and uh, I can't, this is how I came to God as the ground of being. This is how I came into Tillich uh, this past year. And it, it's funny that you mentioned like the four uh, aspects of it, but uh, when I was researching for my presentation on love, power, and justice, uh, I came across a graduate student and he made a comment that when he was trying to make a test for his students on Tillich, he said it was near impossible, but he would phrase the question like, uh, did Tillich say A, uh, this point of view, B, this point of view, C, both A and B, D, neither A and B, or E, all of the above. And the correct answer is always E, because mm -hmm. that's his his writing style. And that's, that's really kind of a humorous way I resonate with Tillich is, um, I, I can, maybe that's the same as Gebser, I've noted. I, I have, again, I haven't read much because I had to stop, but um, just that that passion for, it's not even dialectic style, it's, it's just everything, seeing it to reach a point where this is the furthest I can possibly go so I can reach into that, that mm -hmm. zone of not necessarily all knowing, but at least being, being within that starting point of this is where I'll meet you. Um, but, you, you said that's as far as, I, I'm mis as far as you could go, you found yourself at a limit did I misread you or mishear you? Yeah, I, I kind of was confusing myself when I mentioned that too. Okay, because I think that's a very, very important place to register or to know when we're at the edge. Mm -hmm. And I'm just showing you this. This is a this is a map, right? Mm -hmm. If I put it, it's a symbol that I saw and I'm reporting in. And I'm, this is physical time, space, and whatever this cyberspace thing is. There's a relationship, I'm sure. Now, if I put it on a larger piece of paper, the map has an, has an edge and something beyond it. So this is my personal task, is I can fill this in. This is, I don't know anything beyond this yet, but I can use my imagination. Mm -hmm. I, could, I could start to like free associate all over the place and I'm expanding my map. And then I'm going to be taking that expanded map into the territory when I go to sleep at night, see what happens next. So this is where the, what did we say that, I think it's something we'll be used to say about the map is a performance by the territory. Mm -hmm. So the yep. boundary between map and territory is very fuzzy, but we're we are map makers. And um, I think the, the more we share our maps, if we're making maps together, there will be differences in scale. And how are we going to harmonize that? And which maps get privileged and which maps get torn up and thrown away? That's, I think, really crucial. And I feel like some, I think our kinesthesias, our kinesthetic portions of our experience are extremely ignored. Got a headache? Pop a pill. Get a stomach ache? Pop another pill. <laughs> you know? My, my yeah. grandfather yeah. mapped. My grandfather math has already been popped by Ed. Just to say. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you for that. I, I really didn't like that idea of uh, being yeah. an old crafted old man sitting on the porch. I know. Well, I'm always there to help. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been fun. I appreciate you guys. I might uh, jump on in a minute to uh, listen to the finish up. Okay. Thank all you, right. Doug. Okay. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks, Doug. Bye, Doug. Okay. See you Bye. soon. But, but I was just talking about how our different senses, where some, each of us are, are rearranging our senses in different ways for different purposes in different environments, the visual, the auditory, the kinesthetic. Uh, but I think there's an overlap between all these systems that gets 
uh, exposed in these special, in, in drug states or in dream spaces. Um, so you can start, get, you can get extremely playful. And when you come back into the physical world, I have seen really weird things start to move around didn't move around before. <laughs> so these have, I think, uh, they point to one another, they co-specify, because it's, I think, a non I think we have a non-dual reality. We don't just participate. We certainly are not separate. <clears throat> but there's, uh, it, it's quite non-dual. And I think this is uh, only a few people really are catching on to this, but the ones that are, are really thrilled by it, because it's a tremendous relief. Uh, and those who are still stuck in the you know, in that dualistic grid, uh, you know, we have a responsibility, I believe, to, you know, register the effects of this in a way. Uh, so that, you know, all of this pointing to is co-specifying. So I have a very different notion about what physical space and these, uh, and the non-local effects, Bell's theorem and Lorenz attractor and all this, I think these are all uh, just metaphors. And the topological um, stuff that we've been talking about, and the Taurus, she talks about the Taurus too. Ed, she agrees with you that, that she yeah. thinks that, that the universe is toroidal. Um, well, it's flat. <laughs> it's a flat Taurus. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying, let's use all of our knowledge, you know, and check it out and yeah. find some experiment and keep the thing. And I think most of our phenomenological investigations are pretty sloppy. So that's sort of my my mission in life is to refine our phenomenological investigation and to share that. And, you know, others are going to be physicists. Others are going to be painters or dancers. You know, we're all going to have our gifts that we can bring to the, to the mix. John, at the beginning of your dream, you didn't report this just now, but it was written in the forum. You were throwing a baseball. Yeah. And, it was a long, uh, much longer dream, yeah. We, and I, I imagine you throwing it upwards. I'm not sure if that's yeah. how it was. Yeah, there was, a, there was sort of a parallel uh, universe up there. <laughs> Hard to describe, but there was a hallway. There's a, so it looked like a train station, actually, more like a train station. And I was in, the, in, a, in a replica, a similar. Mine and was, looked just like that person's up there. It was a man. And I had this ball. It was very heavy, and I threw it up there. And he catch, He would catch it, and he would throw it back down to me. So we tossed it back and forth. Mm -hmm. It was surprising that it was so heavy, because in dreams, you don't usually think of the, anything as being particularly heavy at all. That's an odd thing for me to have noticed. But I remembered something that um, Jer Jeffrey said about the orb. He was talking about a gold orb. Mm -hmm. It was made of brass, I think. And he said it was mm -hmm. very heavy. And I think that stuck. And so I think a lot of our experiences in the daytime, things that we muse upon or heard, get get sorted out in those kind of dream spaces because it was a very heavy baseball. Mm -hmm. Baseballs are not that heavy. This felt really it took mm. a lot of effort. Mm. Well, it was associated with a, a, a few things for me. I don't know if they're relevant or not. Um, I mean, one definitely with slaughtered acts idea of throwing the golden ball. I kind of saw yep, that. Yeah, that too. I uh, think that was part of it too. And so, and then there was a play. It's a base, if it's a baseball, perhaps there's a baseball game. When I read that, I imagined the baseball field uh, and a stadium uh, and the parallel universe, the para universe being sort of adjacent to, or you said para, parallel to. Well, I did the man that I was talking to later when I asked him, what is our relationship to the earth? He said, we are para to the earth. I don't know how to see it exactly. Um, it, it reminded me of the movie Interstellar, uh, which plays with space and time and yeah. fifth dimension, the brain and... B R A N E, which I think it was way too concrete. That movie, <laughs> it's not like that at all. <laughs> uh, but there are a couple of some of the special effects. If you show, for for, for in particular, uh, toward the end of the film, when uh, they're out in space, 
in a spaceship. They've lifted off from the Earth. They've discovered a sort of anti-gravity technology, and they're able to uh, escape Earth before it becomes uninhabitable. And the spaceship actually is a, a donut. Uh, and it spins in a way that creates an environment. And the environment, uh, th- as portrayed in the movie, has this curved <laughs> qual- quality to it. So that up is not straight. Up becomes parallel because it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't keep going uh, in, in, in a Cartesian sort of grid. Uh, at least that's what I'm starting to see in in the film or what i'm beginning to kind of associate from your dream to the film that's my we're members of the same culture so i'm taking all kinds of artifacts that i'm exposed to movies and plays and poems i can i can go into the and they whatever these forces are they can use all that and you know i feel like sometimes i'll pose a question and I'll get a response comes from a level that's much more complex or deep that I could come up with, but it'll be using references that come from my actual experience. So I think I don't buy this Freudian stuff about a subconscious that's uh, that we have to sort of be on top of like this hydraulics metaphor where we, where we displace um, these hostile forces with our ego and our super ego above us. I find these, uh, uh, there's a much more benevolent and uh, much more intelligent than my ego, um, these configurations. And you can ask for things and you can get them just like that. That's great. You can ask and they just like that, but who does all that? <laughs> it's, it's a magic act, you know, it's, and it's certainly not my ego, hmm. but I'm part of it. My ego is very important so that the questions can be posed. So I think that's where our participation is very crucial. And I think this is something that Jude was pointing out that we're, I think she said we're like micro processors or something. We're sort of at the micro level, we're recapitulating the whole universal. We're, we're, we're holographic, we're, it's holographic. Mm-hmm. I, one of the, I mean, the most interesting thing that she said for me was that space and time are forms of information. Yeah. I hadn't made that connection before. I have a book called, I think it's called The, the Coded Universe or something like that, The Cosmic Code. Uh, and it's essentially cosmological information theory. Uh, and I never quite put the, um, put the, connected the dots that if space and time are projected, uh, then they're projected based on something, some idea. So, except it's not, an idea is one way of talking about it. Maybe a Hegelian kind of older way of talking about it. Uh, and what she is proposing is that it's information. Now, I don't under- think I understand what information is then. Well, I, if, she's talking about the Planck. What was it, the Planck theorem? What is it? The, pl- the Planck size. That, yeah. that, that being the Talk small about Planck scale, Planck and, scale. It's, and it's pixels pixelated. Mm-hmm. She asked the audience if they'd ever seen an old television set, old color vision. Wow. You'll see the pixels, but you don't see on this HD stuff. But in the, in my experience, when the third eye opens, you're in a dark room, you're asleep, but the third eye opens and there's an ocean of pixels. They're very beautiful, vivid colors. Nothing like it in the, I've not seen anything in, like this in the physical world. And it looks like this. Can you see this? Mm-hmm. Lots of little, an ocean of these little pixels. Mm-hmm. Then they start getting abstract shapes and then they turn into trees and houses and the sun. This is mm-hmm. all in dream time. Mm-hmm. And I have a feeling there's a relationship between what happens in the dream time when the third eye opens and what's happening out here mm-hmm. in the physical world. Um, I'm not, sh- I don't have a vocabulary for this or any very good models and I'm not a physicist, but I'm just saying that I've seen this and it's really, really weird because it's very beautiful, but I start to go, mm. but then it starts to morph 
and then it turns into ordinary shapes and things that I can I can walk down the road, I can open up a door, I can go inside. I've taken a glass out of a cabinet. This happened to me once. And I thought, well, I think I'll break this glass just because I want to see what happens. And so I dropped it. There's gravity, it fell to the floor and it crashed. But I could hear a disconnect between the, the auditory and the physical. I saw it break. Three seconds later, I heard it shatter. So it's I could tell there's uh, the, the visual and the auditory are not in exact sync the way they are in the physical. It's definitely simulation. But I think so is this. <laughs> it's all happening in the mind of God. <laughs> anyway, those are the kind of fun experiments you can start to play with when you get really lucid or do out-of-body experiences and you get really focused. I'm not that focused that often. Um, but when well, I am... Well well done. I take, I take if you advantage have of out of body experiences. Not, not all of us have out of body experiences, John. Um, some of us try very hard, and we don't we don't manage to do that. You're very gifted in that regard, and, um, and well, I, I think I'm very traumatized. I mean, no, I was, well, no, I well, you get, I was beat up a lot. Every, yeah, one of the things I learned from Gapser was something I missed in Latin class, and that is that the word soccer which we, where our word sacred comes from, is also the same word for cursed. So every blessing is a curse. Um, if, if, to me, like reading the Old Testament, um, as soon as God says, oh, by the way, I have a job for you, the first reaction of everyone, from Moses to Jonah, is to beat feet like the devil is after them because this is not going to end well, all right? So it's one of the, and because it's, it is the same, it's one of those fundamental paradoxes that we're confronted with where the blessing is the curse and the curse is the blessing. It's really hard to distinguish when the one affects and the other one doesn't. All right. And to come back to what, what Marco was just saying, because this was the point that, that I had, I, I, I wrestled long and hard being as long as I was in, in Silicon Valley with people who are all about bits and info. And the word information, just if there's one word on the planet that can raise every hackle I've ever thought I had, that's the word. And the only thing that, that, that Jude did to, to mitigate that was she insisted <laughs> in, her, in a very polite English feminine way. She insisted that that was in hyphen formation. <laughs> it was not information. It was in hyphen formation. And that, that makes a whole lot of sense. It, this is one of the, uh, the problems I had with the, the Rashka article that, that uh, TJ had, had put up where, where people take terms that we all kind of understand and then they want to redefine them for a very specific purpose for whatever their philosophical uh, or whatever you know, purposes are. Because you, you always have to get through all of that buildup that all of us have about what that word means, that definition that we have of it. So, so there she was able to kind of get around it, but it's still got this taint on it, this information taint. And she, she pointed out that the bits on the disk that all of the IT people talk about information is not what she's talking about at all. She's talking about patterned. Right. And it's the pattern that is important. And this is what, what you also had in your, your, your picture that you just showed where these little pixelated dots, they, they take on pattern. form because they become patterned. They, and they, the they, pattern is important. And, and I'm, not, I'm not a pattern recognizer as much as I would like to. One of the... One of, person I've been working with for 20 years is a natural born pattern recognizer. And he comes up with ideas and insights that I couldn't even possibly uh, begin to fathom. And, and, and he was also a person I, I met in conjunction with and around that whole young Arthur Young and the Institute of Consciousness kind of thing. So it's the whole idea of patterned information, patterned bits. They're not just random that are out there, they, they, they do start to coalesce, they do come together. Sometimes we recognize what they are, 
Sometimes it is very obvious what they are. Sometimes it's not obvious at all. Sometimes it takes, you know, it's, it is really, um, I, I've learned over the years, going back over it doesn't hurt because you will finally start to recognize if you do it enough times, if you, if you put a little bit of rhythm into it yourself, the patterns can appear. We're not always sure that we've, we've seen the, the right pattern, the correct pattern, the most appropriate pattern, the most efficient pattern, whatever it is. But even recognizing, to me, recognizing any pattern is a nice start. It's like, okay, well, I got something out of this. I can, I can now take this further. It's not completely beyond me. It's not just noise in some way. Can you, is there a relationship between pattern and mind? Well, yeah, I, think, I think very much so. I, um, me too. Yeah, I think, it, I think pattern making or pattern detection is the mind. Uh, well, I, I think that it is a very mindful thing, yeah. you know, being able to see that. That's why I very much appreciate what, you know, what my friend can do with that because it is, it's in the pattern. Sometimes it might be, maybe it is in the rhythm. Maybe it is in the, in the, the, the flashing of light or the intensity of light. It can be in all kinds of media. That's, that's uh, beside the point, but it's that patternness that I think is so important. And I think that's the point that she makes that, which is why I am willing to give her a pass using the word, you know, as I think she's very brave for doing so because it is so laden with so many other, other things um, that, uh, you know, that she's, she's treading on, 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 on very thin ice in a, in a lot of places, you know? Yeah, I think so too. But I think she's like all of us, we have this language you know, we're all divided by this common language, right? And we're redefining. Well, well, well we are, and we are. Framing you know, and deframing. You know, we yeah, have well, to figure it out. Enough, you know, my my friend who was into patterns doesn't really talk a lot about information. Mm -hmm. you know, he's very much into topography in the meantime, and topology, and he does all of those things. And he's a person that really drove the Taurus into my into my my brain. Um, but but to him information wasn't as central as it is to her. That wasn't like his primary vehicle mm -hmm. uh, for, for getting into this. For him, the pattern was important. And it was out of the pattern. What, what does the pattern tell us? And, and not in the sense of what information does it provide, but what meaning is revealed through the pattern. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, because I come out of that, I'm out of the old school where computers were just coming up. And so we made a, a very big distinction distinction between data, information, and knowledge. You know, that, that was a huge deal at one time that's completely been washed off the board as if it never existed. But to me, it's still a very useful distinction to be making when you're trying to deal with things that are sometimes very overwhelming because of what's, you know, what's coming at you. You know, yeah. so well, structured whatever absolutely. is one thing, but information has a structure to it generally. But it doesn't necessarily mean that that structure is meaningful. Right. Meaning is a whole is a whole other degree of intensity that goes beyond that. And she's always, I when I hear her, I hear her always talking about about the meaning part of it. You see, and okay. she's because she's already left a lot of stuff behind her because Shannon, you know, brilliant man, never ever ever thought meaning ever. Never. Right. right. So, but contributes a lot to helping us understand what it is that we're going through, I think. Well, just to make a, a s sort of analogy, I was asking, I was working with somebody and I was asking them for, for the qualities of something. Does it have a size or, or where yeah. is that? Yeah. yeah. Some abstract yeah. concept. And I said, well, where is it? Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, I don't know where it is in my head somewhere. I said, well, when it's in your head, where is that? <laughs> <laughs> really? You asked him that, John? <laughs> and I kept, I was getting frustrated because he was in sort of the Cartesian grid. And I wanted him to just tune into, and he was a dancer, oddly enough. And, I, and, and he couldn't answer me, but he started, he started to go like this. And I pointed to that gesture. Mm -hmm. I said, is, the, is there anything else about that? <laughs> I went, oh, oh, yeah, we're on a lake and it's midday and we're in a boat and there's a pretty lady there with a parasol he was giving me he was downloading all this information uh -huh. oh, he's, 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 <laughs> and then he and went on and on and i said is there anything else about that he said yeah it's very pleasant i went yeah. oh, okay but this was a, this is a pattern mm -hmm. 
He wasn't yeah. able to digital, you know, auditory yeah. digital. He wasn't able to communicate it or find mm -hmm. it in any of his other senses, but he moved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's why I'm saying we're we're pattern detectors. And what I liked about her presentation was her her use of her body. She was mm -hmm. very embodied. She would talk about decoherence. She would talk about mm -hmm. coherence. She would talk about moving between. You know, she was uh, taking all these concepts, and I think she was. I thought she was really very embodied, and that's what I was. Thought was I, I, so she was the most gesticulative English person I've ever seen. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gen generally, if you if you watch the guy that was calling out uh, for the questions afterwards, uh, he hardly moved at all. <laughs> I, I haven't watched the whole thing. I just saw half of it, and I saw two interviews with her. And I, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I did. I, I have to watch those. When, when I start them, I have to watch them to the end. Yes. No. <laughs> well, I'm just wondering how she hooks up with with William Brown. Remember when we looked at William Brown stuff and talking about the void? You were talking about the void. Yeah. And the Superman and she was in, in he was in an interview with two they were asking asking a lot about the void and he was like, Well, you know, it's there yeah. really isn't a void. It's all no. space it's is full. filled with information. No. <laughs> you know? And it's, I and I think you made the point that well, spiritual seekers or spiritual oriented people need to start listening more carefully to the physics because mm -hmm. they're trying to like prove a case that may not be there. Yeah. There may not be a void. It's, no, it's just no. I, kind I don't, of full of information. I don't hear her talking about voids. For her, no, she doesn't. It's very full. Yeah. It's very full. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think William Brown was talking about a void either. Uh, no. Saying, and that was the one thing that when I went back and looked at since, you know, the, the sphere, you know, why, why engapes her in the integral is a sphere. Uh, one of the first things he said, it's a filled sphere. And it was because of the, the brown tapes that we had. I hadn't run into Curve and yet that came a little later. But that, that's, that struck me this time. At the first 300 times I read it, it didn't strike me at all. But this time it struck me that it was filled. And then he goes, and it's transparent. Anything that's filled and transparent is energetic. And that, that's where I see brown coming in because you can't see energy but you can't get around it either. It's, you know, he says it's just completely dense, right. you know, with this, even though it's not solid. Right. You know, so so that there I was able to make another link, link back and maybe establish a little more of a pattern of why, why we're not bumping into each other and nothing else happens all at once. <laughs> Keeping it simple guys. <laughs> So, so I saw I saw this uh, video, YouTube video, a couple of days ago. I, I don't remember exactly how I got onto it. If I looked back at my notebooks, I probably could trace back the exact instigating click or moment or uh, piece of information. But it was uh, it, it was a video of a robot uh, who is uh, being developed by a company called Hanson Robotics based in, I believe, Hong Kong. The robot's name is Sophia. And she is designed to look as human as possible and also to express emotion, to uh, have facial uh, gestures, to mm -hmm. respond, to, to, to interact in conversational language uh, with people. And she's a machine learning robot. So what she will say is not predictable exactly by even the programmer. She's not programmed with stock responses in the way that, uh, you know, a, 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 com mm -hmm. a complicated but not complex system uh, would be. And the way that, uh, and she was on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. Uh, mm -hmm. He uh, he had a few uh, kind of you know, cutting edge robot robotic uh, uh, guests. One was a, a robot that is in the shape of a snake. Mm -hmm. a snake climbed up his leg, kind of like a boa. And then the second one was Sophia, and he had a, a, an exchange with her, and it, it was interesting. Um, she, of, of course, sounds like a robot. She is not believable. She wouldn't mm -hmm. pass the Turing test. But uh, 
it was a kind of proof of concept, I thought, and mm -hmm. of course a publicity stunt and a media event. Um, and it got me to go and do look at their website and look at another video where uh, she's asked uh, by, by somebody what her favorite color is. Mm -hmm. What do you think she said? Blue. Red. Transparent. Oh. Now, I would like to ask about uh, general intelligence and AI mm -hmm. and uh, pattern and mind. Mm -hmm. uh, because my understanding of AI type intelligence is that it's essentially pattern recognition um, uh, functionality. So that's why data is so important. The, the, having a large amount of data to analyze and recognize patterns in is part of what makes an AI system um, effective, uh, more effective uh, than humans because we can't, well, this is maybe something we can talk about. Mm -hmm. But if an AI system is pattern recognition, then what distinguishes a human intelligence or consciousness itself from that function of recognizing patterns in data or information? Well, I think it's, well, does the computer pay attention? It recognizes pattern, according to some people, usually the people who programmed the computer or the robot say they, it detects pattern. <clears throat> um, now, in our last, when we were doing maps of time, you went first and then I was reviewing, I reviewed the video because I knew there are a lot of things I missed. I noticed TJ, when he was working on his, his map, he was physicalizing it. He says, um, well, I, I do mine different. Um, he said he did it different from you. He said, you, you came down like this and he, and he said, mine goes out like this. So that to me, is a he was detecting a pattern between two different maps, cognitive maps, right? But to me, you have to pay attention to be able to do that. And he was also not just paying attention; he was paying it. He was paying to his own attention, and he was paying to your attention. Mm -hmm. And there was an overlapping attention, which I would call a meta and attention. And this is the attention that we have when we're very young. We go outside, we see a bird fly across, and we go make bird sounds, and we flap our arms up and down and run up and down the yard. <clears throat> we're, 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 we're sharing attention, and we're modeling. <clears throat> and um, that's... And we have meta attention. We go to the theater, we'll see a performer, or we'll walk down the street and we'll see someone slip and fall. And we'll go, ouch, that hurt. You know, even though it's somebody else, because we, that, that a capacity to take our attention and go meta with it. Mm. I think all the pattern detection arises out of that. And it's going to be different from person to person. Yet you, you can find something like you were talking about, I think, uh, uh, if you exercise this meta attention enough, something like a meta mind begins to emerge. And can we can we be more mindful of this emerging meta mind, or will it be so elusive that it will, you know, fade and vanish? Or will we be able to find something, label it, locate it, ground it, amplify it, so that there's feedback? This is the big research question. And one of the things I've been trying to initiate because this stuff is very, very subtle and it can disappear so, it has a very short shelf life. <laughs> you know, so you have to sort of do it in the moment. Um, now, I don't know about computers and, and robots and um, if they can share that kind of attention. But I don't think we've even come close to fulfilling the promises 
that had been made around artificial intelligence. For, for one thing, we were, they were supposed to eliminate menial labor, you know, so people could have more leisure time so that they could enjoy their lives. I haven't seen yeah. anything remotely yeah. like leisure yeah. time. First of all, John, they're working on that rapidly. <laughs> Secondly, <clears throat> Vonnegut, for example, wrote a player piano was just about that and all the downsides that comes from it. So yeah. <laughs> you guys, so we, we're, not, we're not filling it. We, we don't have any of the backstory and we're not filling in the edges around that. When I have nothing to do, then I become nothing in a culture that says work defines you. And so we're not, we're not addressing the real issue. And this is, this is part of the problem I have with the pattern recognition. I, I agree with, with Marco. AI is about pattern recognition, but what patterns are they recognizing for which purposes? And this is, I think, what John was, is, is indicating as well. Attention, attention is purposeful. Being it's, able to yeah, point. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm deciding now, I'm going to look at this pattern and not that pattern because it's what, that's what's appearing. And I can follow and, your finger where you're pointing. Where I'm pointing. Yeah, you're letting what, me know. Yeah, Talos and his, his pointing to Ma Michelangelo's finger is one of the, the shortest, most profound little books I've ever read because it simply points out to us merely understanding that you can point. Up until now, I haven't seen a robot point. I haven't seen one come along and go, oh, but over there, this is what's going on. You know, Sophia can love trans. I think that's a beautiful thing to say, but it's also another way to say, I don't choose a color because people choose colors. I'm different. And this is something choosing how far am I willing to go? Well, robots don't really choose in that regard yet. We get to see these wonderful demonstrations. I find them absolutely fascinating because they get me thinking until my brain starts melting. When I, you know, it's good that I didn't see this show. <laughs> because I, I, I now have a gazillion questions flooding through my head about, okay, patterns and what kinds of patterns and are they meaningful patterns and what are they meaningful for? I was watching a, a video about a robot that can do a back flip and it walks upstairs and whatnot. Well, that's all well and good. And it does recognize patterns because it knows what edges are. It knows what elevation is. It knows what balance is and the gyroscope. There's all these things that are going on in there and it can do that. And that's, it's really fascinating to watch, but it has actually no meaning at the moment. It's just, it's just a nice demonstration and it's impressive, but there's, it's not a meaningful, that, that back flip was nothing like the guy who did it off the 10 meter board and won the Olympic medal. It, it is really only in form the same. Facebook has an algorithm now that can recognize suicidal ideation in the pattern of a person's social media posts and other interactions. Uh, and I heard a previous story about this technology. It's more accurate than but, but, people. Wait, wait, say that again. But yeah, can it commit yeah. suicide? <laughs> Let me yeah, ask that's you. a good question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I know where you're going. I, it's okay. Yeah. Can it write poetry about suicide? No, 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 no. no. I, understand. I understand that side, what, where Marco's coming from, because this is a very, I think it's a very important, um, it's a very important point. Well, no, it's also, it's related to the clip, John, that you posted yeah. from uh, the, the day after, not the day after tomorrow, the, that's, the, 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 uh, that's the nuclear holocaust movie. The day the uh, earth stood still? The day the earth stood still. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where the alien Bad. is explaining that, that these other races and other, uh, other planets uh, outside of earth have programmed a race of robots Mm -hmm. to essentially be the police force and to enforce peace on all of the civilizations. And if the, and if the earthlings don't uh, get with the program then, and become a threat to you know, other planets, they will be destroyed by, by the robots. So uh, it's, it, you know, it's an interesting example because mm -hmm. in a way it's, it's very similar to the Facebook piece. Uh, it's programmed by humans for human purposes, prevent suicide. We want, don't want people to, you know, we want people to get the help, help that they need when they're in crisis. And the technology uh, enables 
uh, enables that to happen. Of course, and with, with suicide, you know, people are reluctant to act, reluctant, not sure. The technology takes care of it, and then action can be initiated. And we might imagine in the future there'd be some kind of robotic uh, communication with the person or something like that. Well, well, Could there be a John bot? <laughs> for example? <laughs> Nah. <laughs> they give them a reason to live. I mean, really? No, no. It's about identifying who's who's likely to. It's not about it's not about prevention. It's not about cure. It's about identifying who is likely to. And I think you can do that because. And I I don't think it's all that mysterious actually. One of the things that we don't do very well, most of us, is listen. We don't listen to what other people are saying. And I, 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 I worked with a guy once. We, we didn't get along. We parted on, I'm sorry to say, uh, less than, than friendly terms. Um, but I learned immense, an immense amount of things from this person, um, mostly because he did things that abhorred me. And by looking at that, I, said, I would never, ever do that. But I was always trying to understand, well, why does he think that's okay? But one thing that he told me was, and one thing that's always stuck with me, is you never have to wonder what is important to someone. The Germans say you never have to wonder where the shoe is pinching your foot. People will tell you all you have to do is listen. And in our, in our, in our everyday speech, in our day-to-day -day speech, in the most innocuous of times, we are constantly communicating what is wrong with us, why, where we're uncomfortable, what's, what's pressing on us, what's, what's, what's hurting us, what's, what, we, what, what we want changed. And we're not, we're not sensitive enough to that. But if you had that text quantitatively, if you just had the text in front of you, you could go through and count words and it would immediately become apparent what it is because mm -hmm. of the words that are used, because we keep saying certain key words in those situations that are relevant. I, I was criticized very, very severely in, in, in my last uh, educational program that I went through in educational technology because I applied some of those techniques to evaluations that people had done about learning from, from uh, computers or online learning or let's say technology enhanced learning or whatnot. And there are certain words that keep popping up that tell you their issues are way beyond anything this technology is addressing. They want someone to talk to. They would like a human interface, those kinds of things. But this was considered an illegitimate method, but it is exactly the method that these that the these bots will identify because they're counting words this is how the cia and the nsa and all those people in utah are figuring out what it is that we are doing this is it. why the guy who orders a hot a, a a pressure cooker for his wife and a backpack for his daughter for christmas gets a visit from the fbi because he's obviously this is around the boston marathon time he's obviously building a bomb that he's going to put in a backpack and put somewhere. So, so what we have is, a, um, I'm going to say it for lack of a better word, a quantitative analysis of textual information that does reveal things, but the assumptions that it's built on can be extremely faulty. And we don't know, like in the pattern recognition or in the bot recognition, what are the assumptions that are, that are built into the system? They're just not clear enough for us. Well, and I think that's problematic. I, I think it's good that we identify this person may be suicidal, but we also have to be very sensitive about, do we break into his house and prevent him? Well, no. <laughs> I mean, how can them, okay, let me just, I'll demonstrate. This is a, about pattern and abstract and concrete. A few lines from Shakespeare. King Lear enters with his daughter. She's her dead body in his arms. And he says, my poor fool is hanged. No, no, no life. Why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life and thou no breath at all? 
thou shalt come no more. Never, 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 never. I pray you, sir, undo this button. Thank you, sir. Do you see this? Her lips, look there, look there. He dies. Now we can share attention. We can pick up the pattern. There's something that's said. There's a text and there's something said. And there's a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't see a computer or a robot doing any of this, being able to detect these kinds of patterns. Mm. Well, sure, maybe they can drive that. a car or move, a, move some chess pieces, but I'm still not impressed. Okay. I, yeah, I understand. Find poetry I think as can... beautiful as this, you know, I'll say thumbs up. And beam me up out of here because there's right. very little. But I, but I do think, John, I have to, I have to say that if that text had appeared on Facebook, it would have been flagged as suicidal. Well, they, <laughs> they have to flag down Shakespeare. It would have come in, yeah. I, and, and he wrote, he wrote about human right. minds in their extremes. Yeah, he, yeah. He yeah. I understand extreme. that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In a sense, it would have been right, but he would have got it wrong. You see, and that, that, that was the point uh, I'm also trying to make. So, so thank you very much for that one, John. <laughs> I'm just saying it's so much more complex. Yes, it, there, there's a lot more over that. You know? And they're and reducing us. At a very simple us. level, you can get it. Yeah. They're reducing us to mm -hmm. something that's really not that important. Mm -hmm. And then they're modeling that. And then and they're saying that's all there is to humans. Yeah, yeah. And so we can dispense with them and let the robots do it all. Mm -hmm. I think it's foolish. I think they're not going to save our ass. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> really John, but I'm glad that a lot of these people are being occupied and kept off the streets right now doing this. <laughs> 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 so, so I'm very happy for them to continue going along those lines. You know, I think it, I, because I think it is look, Go, you know, I'm one of these people that it's, if you think you've got something, go with it, go for it and, and see how far you get with it. And when you come up with something where you think, well, I've discovered this, it, upon examination, it may turn out, well, it's kind of like that, but it's not that. And, and, and that's okay too. You know, I, I think that Sophia's is, is, is a really nice, um, it's, it's a really nice PR thing. I don't think it's it's AI yet. I think it looks like AI, but I don't think it is. So we've got a lot to a long way to go with that. But it's 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 cool as far as that is. But when we take the coolness and the and the oh well look we're really making progress. See, I agree with you, John. I don't think we're making any progress at all. I think <laughs> we're spinning our wheels <laughs> that we're making. Well, it's okay, you know. You can look like it. Just don't get all caught up in it <laughs> because you may be disappointed in the end. I think we, you know, I also think that there's just the, the way to go is too far. And if we don't, and this was another thing I liked about Curry Band's uh, talk, you know, we're either at a breakdown or a breakthrough. That right. sounded to me a whole lot like, oh, well, we're going to go to integral consciousness or we're going to annihilate ourselves. You know, <laughs> there's, a, there's you know. <laughs> a phase space between the more coherent attractor and mm -hmm. the one yeah. that's breaking down are you and we're in between we are and and, and she said it could go either way yeah and we're in that could go either way oh, I, um, I think that they have a lot in common in in, in that regard it can go either way uh, there's no guarantee it's going to go to the next the next level of intensity or the next whatever it, we could just rid ourselves of it and, and and as she pointed out and as george carlin pointed out Mother Earth will just shake us off like a bad case of fleas and move on. <laughs> she doesn't need us to go further. <laughs> but we have, we have, I think, I think we have beginnings, middles, and ends. We're in a finite universe and we're finite. Mm -hmm. And that's what gives us our, we're, and we're organic and we are complex. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're unstable and then we find stability and then we lose our stability. And I just don't think computers and 
Artificial intelligence is basically wants things to be convenient and to provide a profit margin. Mm -hmm. Usually people who could care less about the organic, <laughs> really. So I just, as we go to the edge and we're going into this, this phase space to this perhaps more coherent attractor, mm -hmm. the organization, I'm going to bring with me a few sonnets by Shakespeare. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're, That's about we're all, all I've got. We're all packing our duffel bags. I'm telling you. <laughs> I, I, I hope you guys uh, brush up your Shakespeare or your Plato because yeah. you're going to need it. <laughs> I know. This is why. This is why I've always said, John. To me, the real test of what people think is what five books are you taking with you to the desert island? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Or look into the face of the child and you say. Know. Like James Baldwin did. Can you look into the face of a child and say there is no hope? Hope, yeah. Hmm? Yeah. That's, yeah. Stuff, that's what gets you to the next... With the robot. <laughs> yeah, that's what gets you to the next... Uh, yeah. That's the level of coherence. Hmm. Of course, we could drive ourselves crazy. I mean... We could. Well, John, you were going to help us close this... Oh, talk. I just wanted to go back around and just <laughs> yeah. ask you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Did we, did, we, did we crash into the rocks? I don't think so. I, th I, think, I think we made it safely down the mountain. Mm. Okay. You said floating on a raft and the river was peaceful. And I think, Ed, you were talking about um, music background game. music. Yeah. I don't think it got too loud. It didn't get too loud? No, it didn't get too loud. No. no. Okay, great. I got my... I'm not sure what my desired outcome was. Oh, a lucid dream. Yeah. You're, you're in a lucid dream. like a lucid dream. We're right there. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Yeah. So I want to say that um, n after next week, I'm going to be traveling. Mm -hmm. And actually, John, I'm going to be on the East Coast in New York. Oh, around. I'd love to see you. We could do something. Let's do that. Uh, I'll be in communication about that. And uh, so we have next week, we could do this one uh, next one Tuesday. More time. One more time, and then I think we'd be reconvening in the new year. That would be okay. good. Great. I would like to suggest, John, yeah, and Ed, and whoever else is listening, that we 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 use this text that you wrote, John, "Alternate Ways of Knowing." Mm -hmm. yeah. As uh, well, I didn't know if anyone bothered to read it, but it yeah. was something I'm working on. I, I'm not okay. pleased with this at all. I'd like to update it and figure it out. That's fine. Maybe some new things that I've learned here. Well, mm -hmm. I, I've read it. A couple yeah. times, actually. Uh, underlined a bunch of things, had a number of thoughts, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I found it to be really wonderful, beautifully written. Yeah, uh, I think that would be a good yeah. place to start. Oh, great. Uh, I'd agree. I'd agree. Easy, to re easy to read, too, and in, in just in the way that riding on a raft down a, a creek is easy uh, and um, fun. So uh, why, don't we, why don't we talk about this next week? Oh, I'd love to. Thank mm -hmm. you. I'd love your input. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. apart from that, I have no other announcements. Uh, so. Same time next this, week? Same time. So just appreciation and gratitude for your presence and yeah. your attention. Yeah. Your Thank care you. and concern. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah. I think we're co-sponsoring one another really well. Yeah, this is this is what this is really the high point of my week here. Uh, I look forward uh, to it too. Yes, yeah, I really enjoy these little get-togethers, these chats. I mean, I don't have anybody around here. I can tell you that will allow me to talk like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 we'll see each other online too in the forum. Yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah. All right. Ooh. Steer clear of the uh, the algorithms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The <Ooh>. algorithm. <laughs> All right. Bye -bye. Okay. Take care. We'll see you next week.